Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 2.1, The Quakers. Welcome back to the Political History of the United States. Last season, we focused our efforts on the colonial origin story. We examined the reasons why the English were seeking to form North American colonies, who the first settlers were and generally what kind of fates they met. This season, we are coming into a much different situation. The colonies are more stable. They're growing and life, though still far from easy, is far less treacherous than, let's say, Jamestown in 1609. Before we can go any further, I want to take just a moment to welcome any new listeners who are making this their first episode. For those of you who fall into this camp, I want to advise you that this would be a good place to pause this episode and go back. Now, of course, I would encourage you to listen to all 32 episodes from last season. However, if that just isn't what you're looking for, at least check out episodes 1.31 and 1.32, which are our season in review. During those episodes, I give an overview of the things we have talked about and discuss the major themes that came up throughout the course of the first season. It should help make sure that you are caught up with all the things that we will be discussing this season. I also want to mention before we move any further that I have made a couple of changes to the audio setup. Now, the good news is that with some time, I do think the audio should start sounding a lot better. The problem, however, is that I'm learning how to use all of this new equipment on the fly. Well, I believe that over the next few episodes, you will start to notice incremental improvements. Please be aware that there may be the occasional audio gaffe, and I am working on it. If the first season of the show was about the colonies being established and moving towards stability, this season is going to be starkly different. The period following the restoration of the Stuart monarchy in the 1660s up until the Glorious Revolution is a period of great turmoil in English North America. We are going to see colonial revolts against the corrupt government in Virginia during Bacon's Rebellion. We are going to look at King Philip's War in Massachusetts and the long-term consequences of that war. We will look at the increasing fears and attempts to get control of Massachusetts as the colony becomes dangerously independent. This period of uprisings is going to lead to the question that is going to come up from time to time. What is the role of the North American colonies in the greater English empire? This question is going to become a core concern for several generations and will ultimately be a question being asked on the eve of the American Revolution. Beyond the colonies experiencing serious and often violent growing pains, the colonies are going to continue to grow and change during this season. We are going to see new colonies sprout up, specifically in Carolina and Pennsylvania to the north. New Netherland is going to get captured by the English this season and will become New York. All of this is going on under the backdrop of increasing tension in the colonies as well as back home in England. We spent much of last season looking at the different groups that emerged and came to form the American colonies. This week, to start off the brand new season, we are going to do something radical and look at a group of people who came over to the American colonies and became part of the fabric of colonial America. Okay, so we are not really going to be doing anything all that much different today than what we did all of last season. The new group that we are going to introduce today, which you probably figured out from the episode title, are the Quakers. Just as the Puritans came to define life in New England, the Quakers are going to help define the story of the Middle Colonies and their experience. So, without further ado, let's dive into the Quakers. The first question that we must answer is, what the heck is a Quaker? Following the end of the English Civil War, there was a sudden proliferation of religious groups throughout England. The sudden appearance of different religious groups was the result of William Laud being removed from power and the Puritans in Parliament taking control of England. During the years of Charles I's personal rule, religious persecution in England was high. While the Puritans bore the brunt of it, largely due to their prominence inside of Parliament, there were other groups that existed on the fringe of society. Not wanting to come into the open due to the very real risk of persecution, they largely remained small and quiet during the years before the English Civil Wars. Following the Civil Wars, however, much of the immediate risk of persecution diminished, which allowed these various groups to emerge from the shadows. This isn't necessarily to say that they found themselves welcomed with open arms by the Puritans now in control of the government. 
However, while they still found themselves generally disliked and not trusted by those in power, persecution at least was less of a concern. Keep in mind, though, that we are talking about England proper right now and not the American colonies. More on that later today. Among these new religious leaders was a young man from Leicestershire, England, named George Fox. Born in 1624, Fox grew up in a world dominated by religious persecution, political strife, and eventually civil war. Leicestershire itself was a heavily Puritan part of England during this era, something that undoubtedly affected the young Fox. George Fox would have been a child throughout much of the persecution being carried out by Laud and would have been a teenager and young adult during the civil wars. With this newfound freedom, Fox felt free to pursue his own particular brand of Protestantism, originally known as the Religious Society of Friends, which would become better known as the Quakers. Now, there are several versions out there of why this group ended up being called the Quakers. However, the most repeated version I kept coming across is that the followers of the Religious Society of Friends would often uncontrollably shake during their religious experiences and that the term Quakers is referring to that. Regardless of the origins of the term, the Quakers were one of numerous new religious sects spreading throughout England. The Quakers were an extreme version of the Protestants, and in some key ways held much more in common with the Puritans. For example, both groups were desperately seeking a more pure form of Christianity. Both wanted to do away with the perceived decadence of the Catholic Church, especially as they saw its influence in the Anglican Church. However, before you go thinking that the Quakers and the Puritans make good bedfellows, there is a very key difference that is going to all but ensure that the two groups would remain on very different sides of the fence. The Puritans, if you recall, believed that predetermination meant that God had selected those to be saved from birth. Nothing you could do on earth could change that outcome. Quakers, on the other hand, believed that everybody could be saved as people all possessed the inner light of God. Quakers believed that the pathway to salvation was through an individual's own goodness and the communal prayer of the greater group. They did not, therefore, believe in the importance of any kind of formal priesthood, fancy churches, or even the Bible. After all, who needs the Bible when they already possess the inner light of God? Now, if the Puritans had been seeking a more pure version of the church, this is like tenfold past that. Quakers viewed any kind of formal religious structures as being not only unnecessary, but directly contrary to their own practices. Quakers, with their belief in their own goodness being paramount, refused to kill people even in self-defense, as that detracted directly from their goodness. Going a step further, they also refused to pay taxes for the communal defense, as they wanted nothing to do with the death of another. Furthermore, they wouldn't take an oath on a Bible as it made for the insinuation that when they were not swearing on the Bible, that they were lying. And just to make things so much easier for their eventual persecutors, they went around wearing all black so they were easy to identify. These beliefs were shocking to just about everybody outside of their congregation and made the Quakers ripe targets for persecution. The Puritans were always wanting a more simple church, free from the decadence that they saw in the Roman church. However, abandoning texts like the Bible? How much of the legal system in Massachusetts was based on biblical law? And here is a group that is just going to bypass that altogether. This is all a very direct affront to everything that they were trying to do in New England. When Winthrop wrote about a city on the hill, a deviation like the Quakers were certainly not part of the equation. Now, normally, this is where I would dive into the reasons about why the Quakers decided to come to colonial America, but I'm going to hold off on that for now. I want to continue to explore the early relationship between the Quakers and the Puritans because I think it tells us a whole lot more about the situation in the early years of New England. Plus, the number of Quakers is going to remain relatively low initially. Down the road a bit when we come to William Penn and a more substantial immigration into Pennsylvania, we will discuss the reasons behind the immigration. The initial settlement of Quakers in the colonial United States was in Massachusetts. 
we are going to focus on this today and discuss the relationship between those early Quakers and the members of the Bay Colony Church. This relationship is going to prove to be a very good glimpse into the religious situation in New England and is ultimately going to help lay the foundation for many of the struggles that we're going to see happen in New England over the next 50 years. If you listened at all last season, you know that Massachusetts is not really known for its religious freedom and expression, and that it is a trend that is not going to improve anytime soon. Few things better illustrate the feelings of the Puritans towards the Quakers more than a situation occurring with the colonist Mary Dyer. Mary Dyer was born sometime in the early 17th century and married a wealthy man from London named William Dyer. In 1635, the couple immigrated to Massachusetts. Mary was no stranger to controversy and would become a subject of both scorn and interest following her giving birth to a stillborn child that has become known as Mary Dyer's monster. John Winthrop gives us this lovely description of the child which he apparently got from a midwife. It was a woman child, stillborn about two months before the just time, having had just a few hours before it came helping till she turned it. It was of ordinary bigness. It had a face but no head, and the ears stood upon the shoulders and were like an ape's. It had no forehead, but over the eyes, four horns, hard and sharp. Two of them were above the one inch long, the other two shorter. The eyes standing out, and the mouth also, the nose hooked upward, all over the beast and back full of sharp pricks and scales, like a thorn back. The navel and all the belly with the distinction of the sex were where the back should be, and the back and the hips before, where the belly should have been, behind, between the shoulders. Two mouths, and in each of them a piece of red flesh sticking out. It had arms and legs as other children, but instead of toes, it had on each foot three claws, like a young fowl with sharp talons. From this description alone, we can pretty easily gain the most important factor that we need to know right now. Clearly, John Winthrop had some kind of a problem with Mary Dyer. And what was that problem, you ask? Dyer and her husband had become close allies of Anne Hutchinson, who by this point was becoming increasingly unpopular amongst the leadership of the Bay Colony. Dyer's miscarriage was portrayed not just as one of those unfortunate things that happens, but rather as divine punishment for her radical religious views. You may well be wondering about the timeline at this point. After all, with what I have laid out, Anne Hutchinson is still in the Bay Colony. She is expelled from the colony in 1637 and was killed five years before George Fox began his preaching. This means that at the time of the stillbirth, Mary Dyer was not yet a Quaker. As an ardent supporter of Hutchinson, the Dyers were amongst those colonists who left the colony with her following her expulsion. The Dyers would become important members of society in Rhode Island and would become increasingly involved in their politics even after the death of Hutchinson. Mary and her husband traveled to England in 1652, where Mary would remain for a period following her husband's return. While the information surrounding her conversion is limited, we know that it is sometime during this period that Mary Dyer would become a Quaker. For a woman who herself was a follower of Anne Hutchinson, Quakerism would have been an alluring thing. Unlike with other religions, women were allowed far more of a voice as a Quaker as compared with other religious practices. When Dyer returned to Boston in 1657, she was preaching a new set of beliefs. She was immediately hit with harsh reactions. First, Despite the apparent victory over Hutchinson, it isn't like she has left the collective memory of the colony or that the fears of losing the Puritan way in Massachusetts still wasn't a very major concern. As it is, we are 20 years past the Hutchinson trials, and though John Winthrop was dead by this point, that ideology still reigned supreme in the colony. Dyer had been close with Hutchinson and immediately would have been viewed as a threat to the order of the colony. Dyer, along with two others from England, Marmaduke Stevenson and William Robinson, were quickly arrested and banished from the colony. In response to the threat posed by the Quakers, the Bay Colony quickly passed new laws regarding Quakerism. 
passed by the general court, these new laws laid out that anybody belonging to the new cursed sect was to be banished from the colony under pain of death. Reasonably enough, Mary Dyer left the colony and retreated to the relative toleration of Rhode Island. In 1659, however, Dyer would return to Massachusetts following the arrest of William Robinson and Stevenson. Dyer, unsurprisingly, found herself in the same position quickly enough and was herself arrested. After a few months of being held in terrible conditions, the group was released and again banished from the colony. Dyer would briefly leave the colony. However, William Robinson and Marmaduke Stevenson refused the banishment. Remaining behind, they continued to loudly preach their beliefs to the considerable consternation of the Bay Company officials. Dyer herself would return to Massachusetts a short time later. Robinson, Stevenson, Mary Dyer, and now William Ledra were arrested. On October 26, 1659, Robinson and Stevenson were publicly hung for their beliefs. Per the pleas of her family and with considerable reluctance to hang a woman, Mary Dyer was spared and once again banished from the colony. And Mary Dyer did return to Rhode Island for that winter. However, as you all have probably guessed by now, Dyer was not going to remain in Rhode Island for long and would again return to the Massachusetts colony in the spring of 1660. Then governor of the colony John Endicott was running out of both options and patience at this point. Endicott has been in our story for a really long time at this point. He was here before the Great Migration and was one of the earliest leaders in Salem when it was the capital. Withrop and Endicott were frequently opposed to each other's views, however they did share some commonalities. Foremost, both men absolutely bought in on Massachusetts being a city on the hill. Endicott and Winthrop had differing views when it came to the role of Puritans. Endicott himself was a separatist. However, he operated with the same level of protectionism over the religious direction of Massachusetts as did Winthrop. Neither of the two men would have wanted anything coming along and challenging that accepted order. And the Quakers were just that. They were a huge challenge to the order of the day. Endicott was still ultimately reluctant to execute Mary Dyer. With Stevenson and Robinson, the decision had been much easier. They were not well connected in the colony, they were both men, and they were both relatively easy targets. The same would hold true for Ledra, who will meet his death alongside Mary Dyer. Endicott was facing a potential crisis and he had to act in regards to Dyer. Massachusetts was a Puritan colony and nobody was looking to see that change. Dyer continued to pose a threat to the stability that they had built and the last thing that they wanted was for some heretical new cult wandering in and bringing the entire structure down. They had gotten rid of Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson years earlier for a reason and now it wasn't going to be Mary Dyer who turned things on their head. At the same time, Dyer continued to just keep coming back into the Massachusetts colony. And this is a direct challenge to the authority of John Endicott. Despite numerous second chances, she just kept coming back, despite the repeated attempts to simply banish her. Endicott was now facing a serious challenge, not just to his authority, but to the bedrock principles that the colony was built upon. When Dyer therefore returned in the spring of 1660, Endicott really was left with little choice. Unwilling to tolerate the new group and having given multiple chances for Dyer to just leave, Endicott was forced to act. On June 1st, 1660, Dyer, along with Ledra, were hung. Mary Dyer is the only woman to ever be executed in Massachusetts simply for being a Quaker. These four have since become known as the Boston Martyrs. The execution of the Boston Martyrs is going to have a long-ranging effect. It is going to put Massachusetts at odds with England. The effects of this incident are going to be long-ranging and dramatic. Massachusetts has always been a colony that was promoting a particular sense of independence. And this had always been concerning back in England. However, it had never crossed that line into an actual problem that needed to be addressed quite like it just did. However, the events over the martyrdom of the Quakers in Massachusetts was something that went over that line and brought royal attention down onto the colony in a way that they had not previously seen. At the same time that the Puritans were busy persecuting the Quakers in Massachusetts, 
back in England, we are at the very beginning of the Restoration Era. The Restoration is where, following the death of Oliver Cromwell, the decision is made that the best person to rule England is the exiled son of Charles I, the aptly named Charles II. In 1664, in response to these events, as well as needing to re-establish Charles II's role in the colony, a royal commission was sent to Massachusetts in order to get a handle on what was going on inside of that colony. Now, to be clear, there were other concerns that the crown had about the affairs of the colonies, especially when it came to concerns over customs dues. Beyond that, the crown was aware that Massachusetts was essentially marching to the beat of its own drummer and had been ever since that charter allowed the headquarters of Massachusetts to be set up inside of the colony as opposed to back in England. In fact, the primary reason for the commission had been that when Charles II was restored as king, he placed four demands upon the citizens. Charles, however, was certainly interested in getting some insight into the behavior of the colonists in Massachusetts. As to the colonies, and not just Massachusetts, but all the colonies, Charles II was demanding four things. These things include an oath of allegiance to Charles, a promise to prosecute regicides in the colony, an agreement that anybody using the Book of Common Prayers receive the sacrament, or in other words, a pledge to support any Anglicans inside the colony. And lastly, an agreement to extend the vote to all freemen. As to that last condition, there was some wiggle room in the wording, specifically mentioning that the person must be orthodox in religion, plus a requirement that they be of competent estates. This gives the colonists the ability to go in with an interpretation that was probably more broad than what Charles II had intended. In practice, it meant that there was no serious threat to maintaining the status quo in terms of Puritan hegemony. For Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Plymouth, the decision was easy enough and the three colonies accepted the terms in front of them. It is worth noting as well that Connecticut did use this moment to curry favor with the king and ultimately got their charter not only made official, but was also able to have the New Haven colony included under the Connecticut Charter. Massachusetts, however, had other plans. While the execution of the Boston Martyrs did play into the dispatch of the commissioners, the bigger concern for Charles admittedly was getting the colonies to accept the restoration and get back on board, and quickly. Charles II even goes a step further telling those commissioners that they were allowed to bend on these things, just get Massachusetts back on board. So why the hurry? Well, by this point, there is real concern over a war with Holland, and the proximity of New England to the Dutch New Netherlands meant that Massachusetts really needed to get with the program right now. Needing to get Massachusetts to play ball here, Charles II tried basically everything he could. He offered to reconfirm their charter, to which the colonial government said that was unnecessary as their charter already had sufficient authority. The commissioners, despite their efforts, proved unsuccessful in their endeavors. Rather than accepting the commissioners' offers, the Massachusetts General Court actually petitioned the king to recall the commissioners in the fall of 1664, not long after their arrival. Playing their cards correctly, the colonists answered back that such restrictions on their religion might make them look to relocating their colony elsewhere and ditching the English altogether. And hey, you know who would make a good ally? Well, that's right, the Dutch. The same Dutch who Charles II was actively getting worried about going to war with. Now, ultimately, the Puritans did make minor changes to their franchise law. To be fair, the changes to the franchise law were basically just a sham. The Puritans did so in such a way that it just extended the vote to three additional people. So yes, this is not exactly a major enfranchisement of the colony. The church still reigned supreme. Unfortunately for Charles II, and more specifically his commissioners, a war with the Dutch was looming and this was about as good as he was going to get. The Crown needed some kind of assurance that Massachusetts wasn't going to jump ship to the Dutch, and this was as close to that as they were going to get. The colony is going to survive the events of 1664 with minimal damage done, at least on the surface. However, the long-term effects for the colony were catastrophic and will be the subject for many of the episodes this season. As you can see, 
the persecution of the Boston martyrs was not the only concern for the English. Even without the persecution, there is a good chance that the royal commissioners would have been sent over from London anyway. However, with concerns over the actions of the Puritans still high and the need of Charles II to get an agreement in place, sending the commissioners over made sense. Not only could they get that necessary agreement with the Massachusetts colony, but getting some eyes on the ground and trying to rein in the excesses of the colonists was desirable as well. What begins in 1664 is going to end up being a fight that would last for the next 25 years, as the crown would fix their gaze on the increasingly worrisome independence being exercised in Massachusetts. Well, 1664 itself was relatively uneventful and anticlimactic, it got the snowball rolling that is going to morph into a full avalanche in the coming decades. As we are going to see throughout this season, the next 25 years are going to be a continual struggle for the king to rein in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and its excesses. Much of that struggle really gets kicked off here in the shadow of the commissioners and the execution of the Quakers in Boston. Aside from formal investigations and royal commissioners, the immediate effect in Boston is going to simply serve as yet another example of the state of religious intolerance inside that community. Massachusetts was going to remain a Puritan colony for the foreseeable future. The idea of letting in outside groups was completely out of the question at this point. Quakerism is therefore going to remain something that is relatively minor for those first early years. There was tolerance in Rhode Island, but outside of that, being a Quaker was a very dangerous undertaking. It is worth noting that the Quakers were not going to be quick to forget the events that took place in Massachusetts during the 1660s. We are going to see later this season how the Quakers respond to the formation of the Dominion of New England in light that it would serve to destroy the Puritan power base inside of Massachusetts. This is, however, a story for another day. The Quakers are going to see their population remain fairly minimal for the next few decades in North America. It is not going to be until the 1680s when the population of the Quakers is going to rapidly expand throughout the North American colonies. That is going to be directly connected with the founding of Pennsylvania and the coming of William Penn. This is too, of course, going to be a major discussion point. However, since we are going to be devoting several episodes to this, I'm going to hold off on going any further on it for right now. Suffice it to say, though, William Penn is going to play a big role in our season, so we are going to be coming back and spending a good chunk of time with him. Next time, I am going to remedy a mistake that I admittedly made during the first season. Specifically, we are going to turn the clock all the way back to 1632 and address the founding of the Maryland colony. So, until next time, I hope you all have a great two weeks, and I will see you back here then to discuss the founding of Maryland. <laughs>